Thank you so much for joining us. We have Richard Lapchick here and Max Siegel. We're, we, a ton to talk about. Two, two voices. I, I, I'm going to try to talk as little as I can. But, but Richard, first I have to do the intro. So uh, Richard, president of, of the Institute for Sport and Social Justice, also the chair of the DBAS Sports Business Management Program at the University of Central Florida. Uh, he's been working in, in sports and, and social issues for uh, more than 50 years uh, and, and has published 17 books along the way. Uh, we, we, if, if we had time, we could just read those. We wouldn't have to do this conversation, but we got 20 minutes. So we're going to try to get you to condense some of that down. And then with us, uh, Max Siegel as well, CEO uh, of USA Track and Field. And previously, Max uh, was the highest ranking African-American executive in NASCAR while working at Dale Earnhardt Incorporated. So, so thank you guys both uh, for joining. Happy to be here. Fantastic. So I want to talk, we're talking here in early June. So I thought what made the most sense was just to really focus on the last year. As I mentioned, you guys have, you know, have, have decades of experience here, but to, to try to hone it down. I'm curious for, for each of you, when it comes especially to, to the world of sports, how has the last year transpired compared to maybe your expectations a year ago as we we're starting to have this renewed focus on equality and diversity in sports? Dr. Lacks, you want to start? Here. Oh, go ahead. You can well, it's been a year like no other year. You know, as you said earlier, I've been doing this for 50 years and the movement has been really incremental, if at all, over those years. The issue of athlete activism would barely get started with one athlete and the system would shut them down. But in this past year, since the murder of George Floyd, uh, I think everything has changed. I think athlete activism has become the norm. Once the Milwaukee Bucks left the arena uh, in the 2020 playoffs uh, and the NBA and all the other leagues stopped in, in unison as a result of what had happened in Kenosha, Wisconsin, uh, a few days, a few days before uh, that issue is out there and it's going to, I have, I think, have a tremendous impact on sport itself. I think as athletes turn to in, inward to their own organizations and start to ask for more black general managers, coaches, team presidents, we're going to see more action there than we have. Uh, the individual athletic entities themselves. Uh, Max and I have worked together when he was at NASCAR, and I've been asking them to do a racial and gender report card for almost 20 plus years now, and they're doing it this year. The NHL is doing one. We have six conferences that are uh, doing a racial and gender report card, the National Women's Soccer League. All those people came to us asking us to do report cards for them. We've never been asked to do a report card by anyone before, but I think the racial rec reckoning has opened up the door to take a really penetrating look at how far we still have to come on issues of race and also gender. So, so I'd, I'd like to um, pick up on that thing. First, I'd like to say that I've had the privilege uh, and the opportunity to be the beneficiary of Dr. Lapchuk's work and working with him professionally over the years. Uh, and for me, it's it's really interesting. We're at a, both a tipping point and an inflection point uh, in society. And uh, as I thought about the conversation today, I look at the work that uh, Richard has done, and you know the accountability. And, and and I'd like to say, in many regards, he's like a farmer. He's been planting the seeds and building the foundation for this for many many years, and it's starting to harvest right now. You know, I'm really inspired by young athletes like Bubba Wallace, who drove for me, who stepped into a leadership role. And, you know, I have my own children. My son's a senior, plays football in Notre Dame, and my daughter's a freshman in high school. And it is a part of the fabric of who they are. It's in their DNA to make sure that we carry on this great work. Uh, but it's been, it's been an incredible year. And I think that uh, not just from an ideological standpoint, I, I really feel people leaning in and understanding that, you know, we're moving forward culturally. Uh, we're not going back and, 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 you know, the accountability piece is there. And I think that we need to use the work uh, that Dr. Lapchick's done over the years to kind of guide us uh, as we try to achieve even greater diversity throughout sport. Perfect summations. And now as we sit here now, uh, you mentioned the word inflection point. You know, I, I, it's been years since I took my math, but that, that generally means things are accelerating. Right? I mean, do you feel after this year, are things still accelerating? Are, 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 are people trying to get back to the status quo in, in some corners that you still have to now continue to push for, for them? Or, or did we really turn the page and think we'll be different uh, moving forward? Maybe Richard, if you, want, if you want to answer that first. I think a big part of the change is that I think when Colin Kaepernick took a knee in, in 2016, most of the American public disapproved of that. 
but all the public opinion polls now show that the sports fans themselves, which historically have been a relatively conservative group politically, are supporting athlete activism to the tune of 75 to 80 percent. They're asking their teams to support their athletes and act, athlete activism. They're asking their teams to get involved in the community, and they're asking their brands to get involved in bringing about social change. I think that that fan base is going to be an important uh, barometer for the leagues as they support their athletes. They realize it's also good for business to support their athletes doing this. We've been Max and I have been talking about diversity being a business imperative for decades. Well, now athlete activism, I believe, is a business imperative in the world of sports. Um, you know, I'd also say that um, I think that the you can affect attitude over a long period of time. You can affect behavior in the short term. I do think that technology uh, is holding people more accountable for their behavior. Uh, you know, we're not going back. You know, the things that have been going on for many, many years uh, that may have been under the radar are now in public view. Uh, and I think, you know, it causes a lot of self-reflection, um, you know, from a commercial standpoint, people don't necessarily want their brands associated uh, with bad behavior. Uh, and I do think, you know, like I said, culturally from a technology standpoint, from an accountability standpoint, um, people are held more accountable. And, and as a result of that, I think the short term uh, result of that is, is behavioral change. But as people are forced to get to know one another, uh, to really get to know each other, you know, their character and values, we tend to start to find that we have more in common than we do different differences. And so I hope that this momentum carries forward in the future and we see positive cultural change. Uh, and athletes, you know, they, they are, they're, they're iconic and they're influencers and they're ambassadors. And I think the activism is, is a great thing. Max, what do you think the difference was, assuming you agree with, with Richard, that things have changed radically from Collins taking a knee in the summer of 2016 to you know last summer with, with Bubba Wallace or or whichever whatever you want to point to last year. What you think? You think was it technology technological change that that drove that? What, what would you say was like the primary factor in that shift? Well, I, I think a few things. I think we have a confluence of a lot of things. The pandemic. I think you know really trying to do a lot of self-reflection, humanizing a lot of this. I mean, you know, it's one thing when you hear about things that happen, but when you have people that are affected personally by it or you get to experience it in real time and see the impact of it, it really, you know, it, it to me, it causes a different perspective. I was, um, you know, it is my son got to lead a discussion about taking a knee when he was a senior in high school. Mm -hmm. I can't tell you his friends listening to him as their you know peer experience that kind of change of perspective. So so I do think that the you know the exposure, the impact that it has on people that we know personally, uh, um, really has kind of changed the focus uh, a little bit. It's fantastic. Uh, you mentioned the the poor cards, Richard, that the more and more um, organizations are 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 looking to do. And I'm curious as you do those. You know, us at Sportico, we're really focused kind of behind the scenes of sports, uh, you know, the executive level. H how across sports does diversity efforts and equality among executives compare to the, those similar efforts on the field, even within coaching staffs and kind of just the, you know, the, the game day side uh, of the business? Well, this the all the league offices have a pretty good record in terms of racial and gender hiring practices. They're all in the A B plus category, but when it gets down to the team level, that's where it drops dramatically. Um, and that's especially true at the senior level executive positions, C-suite positions, uh, but team vice presidents. And then of course there's the, the general manager and, and head coach that so much attention is paid to uh, when, we, when we talk about racial and gender hiring practices. Uh, but I think your emphasis on those C-suites is really important. And I think more emphasis has to be placed on ownership as well because Clearly, the NFL uh, is, has been embarrassed for the last three years at not getting much in, uh, improvement at all in head coach and general manager positions, even though they've, they've tweaked the Rooney Rule, they put in new policies that seem look, look like they're ready to yield results. But it's the owners making the decisions, and the owners are overwhelmingly wealthy white men. Uh, and until we put the pressure on them to understand uh, that Diversity is a business imperative, as I said earlier. Athlete activism is going to be a business imperative that's going to affect those teams. Their athletes are going to start demanding 
um, more women and people of color be hired in those top positions, uh, then then we'll see see some change. But until those the pressure is on the owners or as the NBA calls them the governors because of the symbolic uh, implications of being an owner of right. people. Um, you know, I think the NBA is is far out in front and has been for a long time. Uh, and the whole issue of athlete activism is, is, you know, epitomized to me. So you probably all read that the NBA has created the Kareem Abdul-Jabbar Social Justice Champion Award. Uh, when Kareem became a social justice warrior in the 1960s, he was ostracized in a lot of ways. He was such a great player that they couldn't keep him from playing. Uh, but a lot of people think Kareem never got a head coaching job because of his not going to the Olympics in, in Mexico City in 1968. Now he's the social justice champion of the NBA. And from, from my point of view of, of the living people who are social justice warriors, Kareem, Kareem stands at the top of the pile. When you, I'm curious to just jump on that real quick. When you're talking about the owners, do you think we need to change the owners or is it just a matter of changing the owners' minds? Well, I think it probably is going to be difficult to do either one, but the, the, the new phenomenon is that we have a, you know, the, the sports fields, the playing fields mm -hmm. are as diverse as any uh, group of, of workers in, in America. And the difference here is they're not only diverse, but they're wealthy. Mm -hmm. uh, and we see a lot of black players, men and women stepping up into ownership positions. And I think they're going to influence the boardrooms on the teams that they become part of. Max, right now, what is the biggest barrier to, to further change, whether it's at that executive level or just overall? Because um, we still do have a lot of work to do. Yeah, uh, several things. One is I can tell you that we have a lot of work to do in the Olympic movement. Um, I am very fr proud of the fact that uh, we are the most diverse national governing body in Olympic sport. However, out of 50 national governing bodies, I am the only African-American chief executive officer and my uh, chief operating officer is the only African-American and African-American female. Um, you know, we, by virtue of our athletes are diverse as an organization, but corporate uh, diversity was through a thoughtful, careful, deliberate, strategic and executable plan. I think that we have benefited as an organization commercially, athletically, uh, because of our diversity of thought. Um, you know, we're better problem solvers, you know, we, we're, we're able to meet our consumers where they are. Uh, and so for me, I'm really proud of the work that we've done and hopefully it'll be a catalyst uh, in the movement in general. You know, people often refer to the fact that they don't know where to go to find qualified diverse candidates. I take some exception to that. Uh, there are plenty of quality candidates out there, but we also have to educate and train students in the pipeline. Um, you know, I can't say enough, like I said about Dr. Lapchick, I, I, I enjoy going down to the students that he has trained over the years to prepare, you know, the future generation of leaders. So, you know, it's at the top, you know, with people that may be in different industries, transferable skills, and it's also the pipeline. Uh, when it comes to motorsports, you know, one of the historical barriers was the perception that the industry was not open and open to people uh, of color, minority, and women. And, and I, it, it, again, you know, Steve Phelps and his leadership at NASCAR has been focused for the last 20 years of creating opportunities in that industry. So it's about exposure, it's about education, it's about access to opportunities, uh, but it is also about, you know, holding people accountable for change. Um, and, and, and so hopefully we can lean in and lean on one another. Um, you know, I, you know, it's a privilege to serve on the RISE board of directors, but to be with other colleagues in other sports and best practices and relationships and those kind of things. But again, access to opportunities, exposure, uh, and accountability are, are, are key for me. Richard, tell me about the pipeline. You're working with students, with young academics. Are, are, are people from diverse backgrounds interested in, in, excuse me, in sports business? Do they see, you know, enough role models in this field to, to think that they have a future here? Well, one of the reasons I agreed to come to the University of Central Florida to start this program in 2001 was after looking at the sports, 67 sports management programs that were existing at that time, 6% of the students were students of color, 20% were women, 20% were former student athletes. And because we do the racial and gender report cards, I knew there were people in the industry who did want to diversify their teams, but they couldn't go to graduate programs to be able to find people of color as well as women and foreign people who had that athletic background. Uh, so our student base has been 45% uh, 
students of color over the 20 years we've existed, 60% women, 60% former student athletes. So that industry that's looking for diverse candidates come to us and uh, comes to us and we have you know, a, a tremendous track record of, at placing those students in, in key positions and organizations kind of getting a head start because of the diverse backgrounds that they bring to the table. In addition to you know, not only getting the business skills here, but we also were the only program in the country that, that teaches that um, the, to use the power of sport to affect positive social change. And, and how do they do when, once they are in the field, once they are in the industry? Uh, you know, I'm the head of the program, so I'm gonna tell you that they're doing great. Uh, yeah. and, and I think they are, Max can, can attest to that. I've got yeah. it probably. We, we, we've had the good fortune of employing graduates from the program. And I can tell you that uh, even coming into entry level positions, the training that they get is, is superior to, you know, many of the students out there. I can't say enough about the work and uh, it's a competitive industry, but the students are well prepared to achieve. Fantastic. The one thing taking an even bigger step back from all this discussion and as we look to the Olympics this summer and then next winter in China, we look to the World Cup and, and cut our Richard. I'm really curious, you know, you have a long history here in, in talking about the potential power of, of boycotts going back to, to South Africa and apartheid. Where do you see those conversations now? Are they happening? Uh, and, and where do you kind of come down on maybe the right way uh, to go about handling these issues which, which aren't going away? The conversations are definitely happening. Um, there's not on the ground protests like there were during the anti-apartheid era. I mean, South Africa was unique in the sense that it was the only time in, in peacetime history that the entire global community came together to try to isolate and bring down a regime because of the nature of apartheid. Uh, we're not doing that in Qatar. We're obviously not doing that in China. Um, but there are human rights violations. You know, I. I Got involved in the issue of human trafficking in, in the last five or six years. And Qatar is one of the worst examples of the exploitation of, of human people who have been trafficked as laborers. Um, and China, you know, is in the news all the time now because of human rights violations. Uh, I don't I don't see a boycott effectively taking place in an actual boycott happening. Uh, but I think bringing the pressure on those regimes through sport is a powerful tool to get people's attention and the threat of a boycott is a very powerful thing as well. Max, with the athletes that you work with and, and talk to, how educated are they about the geopolitics of it all? Because a lot of what we're talking about is, is domestic and there's also the, you know, the, the international geopolitical elements of it. And I'm curious if you see, for, I guess it could be for either of you too, but if you see the same level of interest when, when talking about domestic change and, and going beyond our borders. Uh, absolutely. And I, I have to say that in the Olympic movement, our president of world athletics, uh, Sebastian Coe, is very proactive. Uh, you know, look at global rights. He has taken a leadership role in supporting the athlete's ability to use their platform for positive social change. He's been incredibly transparent with the IOC about it. Um, and, you know, I have, you know, woven in the fabric of, of, of this organization from Jesse Owens to John Carlos and Tommy Smith. You know, we've had activists that are at the heart of social change for for centuries, you know. And, and so for me, you know, the human side, and I agree with Dr. Lapchick, the, the platform is powerful. We need to use it. Uh, but I also have, uh, you know, the opportunity and occasion to work with athletes who were a part of a boycott and their Olympic dreams uh, being taken away from them. So there's a human element to this with all mm -hmm. of the training and the opportunity to compete on the global stage, um, which is really powerful. But but I do think that all of our athletes are sensitive, they're respectful, they're thoughtful, and they look forward to the opportunity to use that global stage um, to bring positive change culturally. Last question for you here. I've got you know, a dozen more I'd love to get to, but and, and you can reject the premise if you want, but I'm, I'm curious for, for, for each of you who, who have been, as I said, you know, in this industry for decades, what do you think happened in terms of, it felt like for a while athletes weren't being listened to or weren't speaking, um, and, and, and how do we prevent that from, from happening again? You know, they have this power now, how do we make sure that, that it doesn't go, go quiet again on, on this front? Well, I mean, they've been crushed in the past when they've when they've stood forward. Uh, you know, Max talked about Carlos and Smith. Neither of them were employed for seven years after Mexico City. You know, you can pick virtually any athlete. Uh, Ali faced five years in prison. 
Uh, Kaepernick, when he took took that knee, I said to my wife, he'll never play another season after this again. And of course he hasn't. But the momentum is just so great now that I don't think it can be reversed. And I think one factor that we really have to understand is for generations, athletes have been asked, are you going to be healthy enough to play on Saturday? You think you win the conference championship? You think you'll win this race? Now they're being asked, what do you think about uh, economic injustices in America? What do you think about prison reform? They're being asked about the fabric of our society and they're being treated as multidimensional human beings instead of unidimensional human beings. And that's a good feeling that they're not going to want to give up. Do you guys think that the debate over whether sports are political, is that, is that over? Is that done? Is that fully behind us? Well, as long as 74 million people vote, voted for Donald Trump, I would say most of those people probably think the debate is alive. Uh, but I think we've moved past the reality of it and, and we're going to see uh, politics be a, a positive part of sport as opposed to it being looked at as a, it be critically if it is part. Max, I'll give you the, the, the final word here. As I mentioned, you know, we're kind of, I feel like we're a year into this renewed conversation. What are you most um, hopeful for, curious about over this next year? What are you really going to have your eye on uh, as we continue to measure progress? Um, a, a few things. I think, you know, from the accountability standpoint, you're seeing, uh, you know, the lifeblood of most sports, whether it's media and or commercial partners, uh, taking a stand and supporting, you know, positive social change. So continuing to take a look, you know, as Dr. Lapchick said earlier, you know, this does affect the bottom line uh, from a business standpoint in terms of behavior and, and, and culture. Uh, the other thing is I, I am a big advocate and a proponent of more ownership mm -hmm. in professional sports. Um, I chose to own a development team in NASCAR because I realized if anyone was going to give the young athletes an opportunity, I had control over my own destiny. Uh, and so the more that we can encourage ownership and leadership and integration into uh, that side of sports, I think the more that we can accelerate this positive change and the momentum that we have going right now. Fantastic. Well, well Max and Richard, it's been it's been an honor for me to, to speak with you. I want to thank you guys for for all the work you're doing, as we've said, you know, it's an ongoing uh, battle. So hopefully we can we can check in again sometime soon. Thanks. Thanks again to both of you. Thank you.